So if I come and take four plates, blame your wife. <laughs> Today my message is about, the title of my message is Go and Let Them Know. Somebody say go and let them know. Somebody say go and let them know. You know, some people have good news that come to them every so often. And due to some people's, I don't know what to call it, previous circumstances, some will call it trauma, they don't even share the good news. Because they feel like perhaps everybody is out to get them. I know in my culture, we can have great news. And some of us, we won't share a single thing about that news. I have a question for the congregation today. Based on some of the good news we receive over the years, have you given the opportunity to share it in terms of the news itself with your family members, your friends, the congregation, the community? Or have we kept them in the dark? Do you know that the news that you have, especially the news of the gospel, is what we are praying for. Is what some people are believing for. Is what people are hoping for. You have the good news in your mouth. You miss a good place to say amen. amen. So if you're keeping silent, and you starve the people of good news, do you know that based on your good news can take someone out of depression? Based on your good news can take someone out of frustration. Someone who was hopeless suddenly because of the news you have shared becomes what? Hopeful. Someone who was ignorant, didn't know any better becomes knowledgeable because you've shared good information. So it is upon us to go and let them know. Isn't it so? When you have good news that can help someone else, the Bible tells us to go and let them know. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We ask that you speak to us. Give us revelational knowledge, revelational understanding. Teach us your word. Though brief, let it have impact in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 24 to 31. Then we're going to go from 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 to 10. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. 
And he said, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. I know some people are here saying, ah, the Bible has cannibalism. Especially if you've never read the Bible, you will say, this is an extreme thing to be discussing. But you understand, those days were famine. Have you ever heard of those stories where people were trapped in some place somewhere and they had nothing proper to eat? And then after some point, they start eating some people who end up dying. Have you heard those stories? So it's not unfamiliar. The Bible is simply the world and its fullness and the existence of human beings, but with the point view of pointing us to Christ. But people are crazy in the Bible just like people are crazy now. Did you catch it? There were people crazy in the Bible, and there are people crazy now. Would you agree? The craziness hasn't ceased. That's why they all need Jesus. Let's continue. So we boiled my son. Let's continue with cannibalism. And ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. So one, they ate one of the sons because they were hungry. And they had an, an oath that the other one will be eaten the next day. But when it came to that point, and the, the one whose son was eaten is asking, let's now eat your son. Look at her response. Say, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. So she ate the son like fried chicken and refused for her son to be eaten. Now it happened. When the king heard the words of the woman, that he tore his clothes, and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath, he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, go, do so to me and more also. If the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. You see, there was a huge famine happening in the land at the time. And so people were starving to the point where there was no good protein. Not even animals we cherish in Canada. You know, some people have dogs as their best friends. Do you know that? Oh, are you living in this country? Are you guys here? No, there's some people, their dogs are their best friend. In fact, they're companions. Years ago, I was at a TD Bank ATM area. And this lady, I won't say what ethnicity, came with a souped up baby, um, almost like a stroller limousine. I was shocked. And the dog, I think it was a female dog because you know how some ladies wear that nice um, vest fur coat? Yeah, the dog had that one. And the dog had heels 
with fur on it and had pants with fur on it. Even a diaper under the pants. Um, yeah, under uh, the pants. And there was music, surround sound music in that uh, stroller. This was downtown when I used to go to George Brown. And I remember, I looked to my right and I couldn't believe my eyes. Because where I come from, <laughs> in some of the parts of that, my country or continent, dogs are being sold as chicken meat. And then here, they are treating them better than infant babies. I mean, the stroller was so, I remember it having shiny rims. I said, this owner must be depressed. Because for you to have that much care for a dog, which is nice, but you couldn't spend the money somewhere else or share the load. Because me, I was coming to get money from the bank and I had almost, not, not even $50 in the accounts. <laughs> and then I see a whole dog. For sure, that stroller alone, you know strollers alone, can cost you a thousand plus dollars. Can you imagine the rims are all shiny? And I can guarantee you, those are real rims. Those are not toy rims. If you're going to put a fur coat and pants and shoes on a dog, who can't say hi to you? Then for sure those rims are legit. And I'm here struggling and I'm saying to God, how can my life be like this? That a dog is living a better life than me. I said, this is what you call being poor. <laughs> Poverty at its highest. Not, not the way you English majors speak. Not poor. Poor. You know, there's poor and then there's poor. It means, it means you are below poverty. <laughs> because that dog made me feel like... I, I understand if a baby looked like that. That's your baby. You cherish the baby. You enjoy the baby. You take care of the baby. It is your duty to make sure that baby is comfortable. But a whole dog has a larger bank account than me. And you know, and I found out from some of these insurance people that they have insurance for dogs. Sometimes $50,000 payouts. Yes. Some of them, they leave their whole estate to a dog. So, instead of coming to this country to embrace dogs, you know, say, a dog is a man's best friend. Because I had that encounter initially, I said, this dog is my enemy. <laughs> my few encounters with dogs, you are doing better than me. I knew that day I could not fail in this country. If a dog can succeed, then I can succeed. <laughs> so these guys were struggling to the point where they're eating they finish eating the dog they finish eating the cats they finish eating whatever creature existed at the time and now they're debating whether to eat their own children can you imagine nowadays if this happened I think the children would have been eaten before the dog. Because that's how much they like them. If I was to show you some pictures from my country, those who love dogs will create a human, humane society. <laughs> oh boy, let me not start before you report me to YouTube police. So, you know, the, the reason why this happened is anytime there's famine in a land, it means there's a curse over a nation. And the reason why a curse comes 
It's because sin has prevailed without repentance for far too long. So anytime there's dryness in a nation, in a people, in a race, in a, it means a curse has been put upon them. And how that curse comes is because they've sinned for far too long and they've not repented of their sins. You realize even in your own personal life that sometimes the reason for your dryness is because you persist in your sin. So what did God do? God raised the king of Syria to draw, to draw them to himself. So what happens is, I'll give an example. So when I was sent here, or when any pastor that starts a church, takes over a church, anything in that capacity, it means that God sees something. That needs repair, restoration, reconciliation, something of those natures specifically to lead them back to him. So God raised the king of Syria so that he can draw them back to himself. Verse 24, it led to a siege. And then in verse 25, the result was a great famine. It talks about it that a donkey head was for 80 shekels of silver. And a cab of dove droppings for about five shekels of silver. And then from verse 26 to 30, we see cannibalism. Women eating their own children. Isaiah 49, verse 15. Look at what it says. It reads, Can a woman forget her nursing child? Is there any mothers here? Hello? Can a woman forget her nursing child? Answer the question. I mean, a father can. We will, we can, we, some of us, we will sleep. <laughs> oh, fathers, confess and be free. <laughs> <laughs> if I was to ask your wives, I guarantee you, they will tell me there are times where you don't seem worried at all. <laughs> but yet the kid is clearly, something is going on. I mean, I can confess, clear. Runny nose, eyes are yellow, and I'm saying the child is going to be well. My wife looks at me with that deadly eye. <laughs> And she goes, take us to the hospital. Ah, but, and then us, we're thinking the hospital will take six to seven hours, eight hours, and then we have to go to work the next day. But a mother, she will stay all night with the child. Go to the hospital. If the child is okay, then she'll go to work as well that same day. <laughs> oh, let's clap for our mothers. No, see, men have the benefit of saying that they're not the ones who have to breastfeed. So we get away with a lot. <laughs> but a mother, oh. I've seen so many horrific news that a, a woman will go on vacation and leave her child somewhere until they died. I said, wow. The scripture continues, it says, and not have compassion on the son of her womb. Think of it. A child can rebel. A mother will receive that child back. The father will beg for an apology. Isn't it so? 
Isn't it so? No, a mother, the, 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 the mother will even go behind the father's back and give food to him, clothes to him, all these things. But the father, if the child won't even dare ask the father, because the father will look at you up and down and say, who born you? <laughs> for, for people who don't understand pidgin English, it means who's the one who gave you birth? <laughs> Let's welcome the pastors who stored my member. They, they store and they, today, we will deal with it today. <laughs> Surely they may forget. And look at this beautiful promise from God. Yet I will not forget you. That is good news. You know that? There are many people in life today who think they're all alone. They're living in depression, living in deep sadness, living in the dark, believing that no one loves them, no one likes them. They come, they dress nice, they go to church, they go to work, they go to clubs, they go to all these places, but they are alone, feeling like it. But the Bible says that compared to a mother's love, a mother's compassion, a mother's nurturing nature, God is even more consistent and more loving than that comparison. <laughs> that even if, the Bible even goes as far in parts of the scripture says that even when your mother and your father, the ones who are supposed to take care of you, forget you, I will take care of you. That's good news. That's the gospel. That in our sin, God could have left us to die and to face the judgments that would lead us all to hell. But what did he do instead? He brought hope. He brought salvation. He brought healing. He brought reconciliation. So that when we accept him, we also receive all those things. You don't have to cry alone, my dear. You don't have to be sad all by yourself. Only if you would open your eyes and lift your heart to the Lord, he will wipe away those tears. Because he says, he will never forget you. There are many people who forget people. Me, I have to practice to remember people. <laughs> because once I move on, I move on. <laughs> when I was getting married, it was my brother that reminded me that I have to invite my childhood friends. Because I haven't spoken to them in 10 years. And I was thinking about my money and pockets. So I had to call them about two days before. Oh yeah, I'm getting married. What? <laughs> You are invited. Oh, really? <laughs> Even I may forget you. But the Bible says that God has a memory better than an elephant. Better than your wife. You know wives have long memories. They say they have forgiven you until you upset them again. Then they'll remember the very thing they said. They have forgiven you. Don't look at your wife before you get yourself into trouble. <laughs> you don't want problems. If you've been married for t 20 years, let's make it 30. <laughs> if you've been married for 10, let's make it 20. If you're married for five, let's make it 10. If you're married for one, let's make it five. So be careful not to look at your wife when I'm saying these things. Or else the sermon will become a warfare. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you see it. He says that, yet, I, 
God will not forget you. So many people have forgotten you in life. So many people don't remember you. All that you did for them, they have never brought it into a form of thanksgiving to you. But do you know that God says he will never forget your labor of love? In Hebrews, you know that? Do you know that God tells you that he will never forget you? Not just what you do, but who you are. The precious child that he brought into this life. You may not know anything about God. You may not know anything about Jesus. But if there's one thing I would love for you to take away with you today, is that he says, yet, I will never forget you. Your mother remembers you or may not remember you. But God has a permanent memory specifically with your name and who you are in it. As we learned a while back, he loves you and he likes you. There's no need to remain depressed. There is no need to remain down. He loves you. He cherishes you. He holds you dear in his heart. Me, I'm not, I don't, whether somebody likes me or not doesn't sway me. Because you know, in ministry, pastor, you know, there are people who are in your church that still don't like you, but they've refused to leave. But if I did it for that, then I might have quit a while back. I do it because God loves me. And he wants me to tell others that he loves them. That's the gospel. He shows you his love, you receive it. You take that love and you offer it to someone else. Go and let them know that he loved me. So, I'm giving you the same news that he loves you. So do not be depressed any longer. Do not be sad any longer. Do not be in that bondage of sin any longer. He's offering you an abundant life. A life without tears on your pillow. A life without hiding in that sin that once you go through that sin, once you smoke that weed, once you do that pornography, once you do that drinking, you feel horrible once you're sober. And you say, why did I do it? Do you know that if you accept Jesus into your heart, he can lift you off of any of those things. You may find it difficult, and the reason why you find it difficult is you're doing it in your own strength. It's definitely not possible within your own strength. It's not. It's only possible if you take his love and his strength. Then he will give you that supernatural touch that you did not know you could even have so that you can be set free from that very thing you are going through. I know you came to dedicate a baby. But God came to set you free. Amen. You had plans to do whatever you want. You came here to do this and do that. And we will do all of that. But even more valuable than that is that he has your name ready today to write in the Lamb's book of life. That being a child of God is all he wants you to know. That once you're his child, he'll take care of you. There's not a single time any person who's dedicated to this awesome father of ours that he has ever forsaken us or left us. He has never, ever. I've been doing this one for Cambridge for nine years. Never has he forsaken me or my household. Never has he left me begging for bread. Never has he left my prayers unanswered. At some point, that prayer gets answered. At some point, that thing gets solved. At some point, 
because he walks with me because I've accepted him and his love. When somebody loves you, you know, they will check on you. They will watch out for you. You know your wife loves you when she calls 10 times a day. Where are you? But I, I was, you just, we were just with me 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Where can I have gone? <laughs> How long are you going to take to get home? <laughs> oh man, is this so? <laughs> and they will call. They will call because they love you. Wives, you love us? <laughs> that, that I do wasn't strong. Because you said it very loud when you did the vows. Wives, do you love us? Oh. Are you not here? No, I'm asking a question. Wives, do you love us? <laughs> because we know you love us because you remember us. Even after 10 minutes you leave church. You will call us about what? Five times. And then it, that becomes our time clock to figure out what we're going to do next. So then we, we, we try to see if we can wrap up the talking. <laughs> because our wives are calling us. They are our alarm clock. They are our chefs. They are everything. They are blessed. But God is even more. If you think a woman can take care of you, God can take care of you better. This God that we are talking about, if you don't know him, believe me, you need to know him. He's such an awesome God. He's such an amazing God. I remember asking one of the men of God in our denomination, all nations, Dr. Chum to be exact, I asked him, you've been doing ministry for a long time. This is when I first started. I said, what keeps you going? Because I know ministry has a lot of headaches and hiccups and all these things. He said, what makes him going? It's two things. Number one, that the love of God abides in his heart. Number two, that he can offer the same love to someone else. When he sees them offer themselves to Jesus, it renews his strength. It refreshes and he remembers that's what we do it for. That's what God is offering to us this afternoon. His love. I want us to rise to our feet. This is actually half my message. <laughs> but I wanted to land there because of everything that's going on. I want you to close your eyes, bow your heads. Maybe the message spoke to you today. At the end of the day, when we die, we will, be we will be by ourselves with God, facing the results of judgment or reward. So don't worry about your neighbor. God has touched your heart today. I want you to focus on that. If you are here today and you're saying to yourself, I do need God. I do need Jesus. Either I've left him. When I was a child, I knew him. And I've gone so astray. And I want to know him. Well, today I'm letting you know. He wants to know you too. If that's you, just raise your hand. Bow your heads, everybody. Raise your hand. If you want to give your life to Jesus. Rededicate your life to Jesus. I see the hands. Raise your hands so that I can see it more clear. I see a few. Praise God. Keep your hands nice and high. I just want to pray with you. God is calling more people. Do me a favor. Can you come forward if that's you? Those who raised their hand, come forward. Come forward. Come forward, my brother. Just come. My sister, come. There's a few of you that raise your hand. Come forward. Come. Come forward. If there's the last message, I'll preach. 
is the salvation message. Because that's the most important message of them all. There's a few of you that raised your hand, you're shy. It's your finest moments. God is calling you to himself again to dedicate your life or rededicate your life. There's still spots for you. I'll give a few seconds to a few people who you know God is speaking to you. He's touched you today that you say that I'm tired of living the life that I've been living. I need that. I need peace. I need a peace of mind. I need hope again. I need to be set free again. I need to be delivered. I need to be able to smile genuinely again. I've committed my life. Thank you. God bless you. I've committed my life to other things for far too long. It's now time to commit my life to you. This is the right time for you. Come forward if that's you. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your youth. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It doesn't matter your status. God loves you and he cannot forget you. Today he has remembered you. Let us bow our heads and just repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you. Today, you've remembered me. You have let me know that your love is greater than any other love. Therefore, today, I confess my sins to you. And I ask you to forgive me for all of it. Wash me with your blood. Hold me. Take me. Make me your dwelling place. I ask you to live in my heart. From this day forward, I give my soul attention, my whole being to you. I will live for you. I will commit to you. Thank you for this good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. If you don't have a home church and you live anywhere near one of our churches, we have about 30 churches in Canada and 168 around the world. Please, whoever invited you, let them with us connect you to one of our branches so that you can start walking the life of Christ the way God desires you to. Your life will never be the same.